All right, I think we can start. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this online workshop. My name is Linda Grand. I'm an analyst at the city of Milpitas, and I focus on water conservation. And I'm super excited to have Jennifer here to teach us about succulents. So we're going to give you a little bit of background on Bosca and these classes, and then we'll, we'll let Jennifer take it away. And just let me know when to do next slide, Linda. Uh, yes, next slide, please. Okay. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so hi, everyone. As you can tell, um, we are participating via Zoom. I'm, uh, I'm assuming a lot of you have gotten your Zoom badge already, but still just want to go over some logistics. So you attendees are all muted by default. Jennifer will pause throughout the presentation to, ask, to answer questions. Throughout the presentation, we, should, we would like you to ask questions in the Q&A. You will see on the bottom of the screen. Um, and you will also be able to raise your hand when the talk is over to ask Jennifer directly and we'll be able to unmute you. Please do not use the chat function. We, we will be easier to actually respond to questions by using the Q&A. So please do not use the chat function. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the BASCA website. Uh, next slide. I wanna give you a little bit of background about BASCA. BASCA is a special district that represents the interests of 26 cities, water districts, and private water companies, all of which purchase wholesale water from San Francisco um, as a PUC. Our member agencies collectively serve over 1.8 million residents and 40,000 businesses in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda counties. And Bosco's goal is to ensure a reliable, reliable supply of high quality water at a fair price for Bosco's agencies and their customers. Uh, next slide. Consistent with that goal, Bosco provides a regional water conservation program to support Bosco agencies in improving water use efficiency. The landscape education program is one element of that conservation program. While we have made significant strides in water use efficiency in the past decade, there's still more room for improvement. Outdoor water use provides the single biggest potential source of untapped savings. Reducing outdoor water use through the use of water efficient plants, such as the succulents that you'll learn about today, and innovative techniques can help conserve water to ensure that future water supply needs of our communities are met. Next slide. So I wanna highlight a few of the BOSCA programs. Um, since on these webinars, we do have residents coming from all different BOSCA agencies. I would say if you are a Milpitas resident, I will be going over the Milpitas specific programs in, in a little bit, but these are programs offered to BOSCA agencies and you can go onto the BOSCA website to see if your agency participates. So the first program is the Lawn Be Gone program. This program provides rebates to customers of participating water agencies for replacing lawn with water efficient landscaping. BASCA also has a rain barrel program, which provides rebates of up to $100 for purchases and installation of rain barrels. Uh, next slide. BASCA also has a smart controller Rossio program, which provides instant rebates and heavily discounted pricing on purchase of the Rossio 3 irrigation controller. This controller can be operated on your smartphone and normally retails for $280. Through this program, customers of participating water agencies can purchase the smart controller for $100 plus tax. Last but not least, look out for Bosca's Redesign Landscape Rebate Program. This program incorporates the current Lawn Be Gone program and rain barrel rebates while adding additional incentives for stormwater retention features. For more information or to find out which one of these programs are available in your area, visit bayareaconservation.org. Next slide. 
So I just wanted to let you know that we're kind of in the start of our, our, our spring season here. So we've got a lot of more upcoming Bosco webinars. Um, specifically, here at Milpitas, we'll be co-hosting the Edible Waterwise Gardening for Beginners. So please join us for that. Um, and we will also have future programs as well. Next slide. So you can find more resources at bayareagardening.org. Next slide. So now focus as if you are a Milpitas resident, we work with Valley Water for our rebate program. So very similar to Bosca's, but um, you will be going through Valley Water. So we offer a landscape rebate program, which includes $2 per square foot of lawn replaced with drought tolerant plants, such as succulents. Um, we also have irrigation equipment upgrades and rainwater capture rebates. We also wanted to highlight Valley Water's WaterWise indoor serving kit. This is something you can easily do at home with your kids to try to learn more about where your water is coming from and also learn how to fix um, common household leaks. You can learn more about all of the programs Milpitas offers at savewatermilpitas.org. Next slide. So happy April, everyone. It is Earth Month. So here at Milpitas, we're not just celebrating Earth Day, we're celebrating Earth Month. So this class is one of our events happening during this. We have other future events, such as we're holding an Eco Heroes Kids event, which will be a kid-friendly show to kind of learn what you can do to, to be an Eco Hero yourself. We'll be holding a climate reality presentation where you'll learn more about how to model the effects of climate conscious behavior and policy making. And you can, we're also offering litter pickup kits and we're gonna have a compost giveaway as well. So lots of fun events coming up. We're also doing a social media challenge where every Monday we're posting to the city of Milpitas Facebook group, um, the recreation Instagram group and our Twitter on different challenges you can do to show um, that sustainable actions, such as our most recent one is supporting local businesses. So post a picture on Instagram about which local business you love, use the hashtag Milpitas Earth Day 2021, and you could win um, several different prizes, such as a water conservation kit if you complete four of our challenges. So please participate, have a great Earth Month, um, and that's all of our updates. So now I'm going to introduce Jennifer. Hi. <laughs> so Jennifer here is the owner of Westwind Succulents. Since she was a young child, Jennifer has loved being in her mother's garden, who became a horticulturist and landscape designer while Jennifer was in high school. Before Jennifer started her succulent business, she studied painting and sculpture at California College of the Arts and worked at Macy's in San Francisco doing window display production and design. After leaving the corporate world, she began working more often doing landscaping with her mother's business and doing various freelance artwork. Meanwhile, she started growing succulents on a windy rooftop in West Oakland as a hobby and found herself only wanting to be in her nursery. In 2018, she created her business, West Wind Succulents, which is now in Lafayette, California, with a new storefront at 5510 College of Oakland. Jennifer specializes in eco-friendly succulent decor for weddings and special events, as well as custom arrangements in a small scale landscape design using plants from her nursery. She teaches workshops such as this one and classes on crafting with succulents, propagation and plant care. So as I mentioned, she recently opened a storefront, which is super exciting. And uh, we're really happy to have her here today to, to discuss water rice planting with succulents. Jennifer, I'll let you take it away. Great, thanks, Linda. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, we'll jump right in. And like Linda said, if anyone has questions, feel free to jump in. Um, I like visual, a lot of visual aid, so I have a lot of slides. Um, and I, I get excited about succulents. So um, I have a lot to say, so I'll try to, like I may kind of zoom through 
So if I go too fast or you don't understand something that I said, like, please feel free to um, put the question in the chat and I will try to get back to it. Um, so yeah, landscaping with succulents is great because they're so forgiving and easy. So first we'll just kind of do a little intro about succulents. Um, they're defined only by the water stored in their leaves. Succulent plants have tremendous varieties of colors, textures, growth habits, and forms, which makes them a great thing to use because you could do a whole yard easily with just succulents and cacti and have a great assortment. Um, their ease of propagation, drought tolerance, and low maintenance requirements makes these plants the perfect choice for practically everyone, especially beginners. So if you are new to plants and landscaping, these are a great one to start with because they will forgive you. They want to live. <laughs> they naturally grow in an incredibly unforgiving climate, so though they have found ways to ensure their survival. Um, they, yeah, they're just the perfect plant for beginners. Um, so here I wanted to share just a few uh, resources with you because the um, a big question I get a lot of times with succulents is really the only thing you need to take into consideration about what types you use are if they're um, frost hardy or not. So you'll often hear the term um, a soft succulent versus a hardy succulent, which just basically means can they survive below freezing temperatures or not. Um, a great way to find this out because every succulent is different, even among certain genuses, um, they, can they can have different needs. So a great way to determine if a succulent will be happy for you um, throughout the entire year is check your USDA plant hardiness zone. And um, there's a great website, you can just Google plant hardiness zones and this website will come up with the map and everything. Um, another site that I love is worldofsucculents.com. Uh, I use it. I use that for a lot of times for identifying specific names of plants. There are so many different ones these days, especially with all the hybridizations happening that um, sometimes it's hard to find out even for me. And so uh, you can reference that for the temperature needs as well. Um, some other fun places that I just want to throw out that I'm uh, particularly attached to is the Ruth Bancroft Garden and Nursery in Walnut Creek. If you are into succulents um, and you haven't been, I would really suggest you go. It's, they do self-guided tours. It's just, I think like $10 to get into the garden and it's beautiful. And um, they also have a nursery so you can buy plants for your yard. Um, another place that's kind of out in the middle of nowhere is uh, Poots Cactus Nursery in Ripon, California. Um, they are a family run business that has been there for a very long time and are just gaining some traction because of the popularity of succulents, but they're great. It's about um, like two ish hours away um, from the bay, uh, maybe a little bit less and they're great. Check them out and they have tons of stuff for sale. Okay, so let's get into the actual design. So um, before I like go into the care and stuff of the succulents, let's talk about basic visual design for creating a landscape. Um, the things that I like to think about are balance and variation of color, texture, sizes, and shapes. Um, these ele elements should create good movement. Um, so meaning the placement of the plants dictates how your eye moves through the garden. So you can see here, these are um, really great examples of just different variations and like especially with this stripe of Echeveria cluster together here it kind of gives you a focal point for the foreground and we'll go into more details about that. Um, so with color um, this you can see this is kind of I would consider a pretty restrictive color palette um, but it's powerful because of that and they they bounce off each other really well um, something to consider when you are picking your colors. I mean, you could just kind of do whatever and do all the colors, which is fun too. But um, sometimes it's fun to kind of like pick a strict palette. And if you are doing that, um, I would say, uh, think about what's called a bridge color. This is a common thing, um, even with like florists and other um, types of art, which is obviously where I look at it from. Um, it's, it's a way to bring like two very different colors together so that you have a nice cohesive uh, palette. So it's soft and has good movement. Um, so textures and shapes. Um, 
think about the plant leaves and how different they are. So I like to put different shapes and textures next to each other so that you can really see them. So you can see how different this leaf of the agave is versus the tiny little texture of this uh, sedum. And, um, you know, just for example, like if you were to put a bunch of things that have similar tiny fine textures, they kind of might get lost. So I like to put different things next to each other so we really see them. So it's not just one big mush and every plant gets credit for how awesome it is. <laughs> Um, another thing to think about is movement and grouping. So the placement of your plants will dictate, dictate how your eye moves through the space. So I love this um, example. It's, you know, this is a very specific type of a design. I would say this is like a more modern kind of minimalist design. Um, but I use it as an example because there is great repetition and um, the way the plants are placed kind of feels random, which in my opinion, I, I like, some people like to do things like in a row and it, and that's fine too. Um, but just my personal preference, I like doing things that feel like they just grew there naturally. Um, so it doesn't look forced. And um, and I think this does that very successfully. And the, the these big rocks are an, another awesome thing to consider adding to your succulent garden. Um, succulents naturally grow in and around rocks. So this will be a nice companion item for your yard. Um, and uh, just a little note on that too, if you're going to do that, I highly recommend partially burying the rock in the ground so that it looks like it's been there a long time. So you didn't, doesn't just look like some thing plopped there, <laughs> you know, that will help. Um, and then I also like this as an example of good design because, um, they use the top dressing of rocks really successfully here. And that's another good way to like fill space, to keep weeds down, to keep moisture in, and it looks really nice. And they have good variation of color and shape there as well. So here, I like to throw these in because um, I question, you know, again, to each his own. But for me, I don't feel like these are as successfully good designs because of a couple of things. Um, one, for example, here, the, like grouping can be good to an extent, but I feel like this is a little bit too blocky, right? You've got like Aeonium, the agave, and then the striped Aeonium up here. And it's just like a bit clunky to me. Like, I feel like you could mix it up so much better and have more variety. And it looks a little unnatural to me as well. So um, another example uh, with the rock top dressing, like I mentioned before, I don't feel like this is very great because when I see this, all I see are the rocks that like, it's so bright and contrasty that like, I don't even pay attention to the beautiful succulent. So I feel like that is a fail. <laughs> um, so picking like more natural colored rocks is good too. Like, you know, things that like have a, have a bunch of different colors within one, or maybe like using just one color, if it's going to be that bright. Um, this other photo here is another use of rocks that I feel like the scale is, is addressed here where the size of these rocks feels a little bit big for the size of the plants. Um, so maybe, maybe just think about those things. Um, here, um, there's a lot of good size and height happening. So um, here we have, it's a, it's a lot, but it's great. You have a nice area right here where there's some sand and rock. So it's like a place for your eye to rest. You have a lot of different sizes, a lot of different colors, and you can see there's good contrast between like this dark Echeveria and this smaller bluish Echeveria. And then you got a couple bigger things mixed in there. Um, this one on the right, I think is really, really good because, um, it takes into consideration the other architecture of your space. So that's something that you should do as well. So if you have this area like this, that's up against a fence, you probably want to put your tall things in the back up against the fence and your shorter things in the front, right? So nothing is getting like covered. So you actually get to see all of your beautiful plants. And then it also breaks up that big backdrop of the fence. So think of it like your canvas, your, you're painting it. <laughs> Painting with plants is what I is what I like to think of. <laughs> um, and you don't have to use just succulents. There's lots of great plants that work really well with succulents, um, such as drought tolerant trees. This acacia is really beautiful. 
Um, this Circidium hybrid is really great and it's semi evergreen. So that just means that depending on like the climate you're in, it can lose its leaves for like just a little bit or even sometimes not at all, um, depending on where you are. Um, this dwarf, dwarf eucalyptus is awesome. There's uh, so many kinds of eucalyptus that don't necessarily get 30 feet high and they can be really nice. Um, they also can add a really nice kind of canopy for your plants because um, we'll talk about this more in depth later, but not all succulents want to be in blasting all day sun. So if you can kind of give some of them a break with a tree or a shrub like this, they're going to be a lot happier and not as stressed and you won't have to water them nearly as much because they won't be drying out as fast. So I love mixing these in. Um, other things you can mix in are these grasses. Like there's so many different kinds of grasses and there's usually a lot of them are very drought tolerant. Um, I love this blue fescue because the color is fantastic and it doesn't get huge. So it's really good to pop in there. Um, protea are amazing. There's a lot of different kinds of those um, and they look insane as you can see when they bloom. This is actually from the Ruth Bancroft garden. So they don't only have succulents either, they have a lot of other very interesting plants. Um, and shrubs um, such as this Arctostaphylus um, is great too. I think the color is fantastic with a lot of the bluer succulents kind of bounces off of each other. Um, um, other things to consider with your design is to create focal points. Um, or like vignettes, or I sometimes call them little moments. <laughs> so um, that it like, you know, like just like a painting or something, and you, you have kind of like a nice focal point and then it allows your eye to kind of move all around that. So clearly with this, this fountain kind of becomes the focal point of this yard as a nice start. And then you, uh, you get to appreciate all of the stuff around it. Um, rocks, I talked about that before. And um, oh yeah, another thing to think about is like your front yard versus your backyard, because you know, they could be very different. You might want to, you might spend more time in your backyard. So you wanna think about how you move around the space. Um, so don't put like really spiky things maybe in your walkway. Um, I, have, I have hurt myself many a time on very intense agaves and cacti. So like really consider where you're putting them and like if it's by a hose bib or by a doorway like try to keep those very out of the way so um you still like them <laughs> um and let's see what else um oh don't be afraid to remove things that aren't working or clutter your yard um sometimes it's really hard to to move around stuff and it's okay if you want to get rid of something you can try to transplant it give it to a neighbor um throw it up on next door and see if anybody wants it um and just kind of like you know get rid of what's not working um another thing to think about is mounding which is really good for drainage and it also adds a lot of visual interest this is a little strip of yard that uh we did a couple months ago in San Leandro. And you can see it's kind of not the best photo because of all the shadows, but you can kind of see here what we started with. This strip was just flat and this brick wall um, or cement wall was just exposed. And like, not only was that ugly, but we thought it would be much better to have this kind of flow and movement. So what we did was we placed the rocks first, which I do suggest doing that or like starting with your big things first, if you are starting with like a blank slate. Um, as like I said, like your focal port points are like things to work around. And um, this is kind of what it ended up like we put, you can put pots in the landscape. I always think that that's fun. Um, this was freshly planted. She wanted a uh, room for things to uh, not only grow in, but in case she found more cool succulents she wanted, she wanted some empty zones. So that's something to think about too. Um, you, you know, some people want like instant gratification and you can buy a bunch of big plants and put them in and that's totally fine. But um, other people want to like watch it grow and see how things fill in and have room like she did for finding more fun stuff. So um, just stuff to think about. Um, so watering succulents. Um, actually, maybe that's a good place to stop if Linda if there's any questions or I can start going into care. We have one question if you have a recommended place to get a large lava rock. 
Oh yeah. Um, well, I don't know. It might be kind of far for, I know people are all over, but, um, the place I like for rock big and small is, uh, American soil and stone in Richmond. That's where I get my, my potting soil from. And I love it. It's the best potting soil in the land. That's all the questions we have right now, but okay. everyone please continue to put them in the Q&A. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'll get into more of like the care of succulents. Um, so general rule of thumb in the hot months is to water about once a week um, in pots. I mean, it can, and it could be a little bit more, a little less. It's just like kind of a general rule of thumb depends on where you are, how hot it is that week. Um, all of that good stuff, how much, like I said before, how much shade you have, um, how well your soil drains, but that's like a good rule of thumb. And then um, in the winter, you're going to water like way less, if not, like kind of not at all, depending on your situation. Um, and in pots, when you water those, make sure to water deeply enough for water to run out the drainage hole. And then you're going to wait again before you water for it to fully dry out. So I always like to tell people, think about um, succulents like in their natural environment. So, I mean, usually when it rains, it really, really rains and then it doesn't again for a long time. So that they're used to that like big cycle of drying out. So they don't wanna stay moist or they will rot. Um, so uh, drip systems are the best way to water always for conserving water, just because it goes like exactly where you want it to go. Um, if you don't have that, or you have like a smaller space and you're fine with hand watering, that is also totally fine. Um, I actually really enjoy it. And I definitely use these um, watering wands. I think they're great for being able to like really direct where you want it to go or the want the water to go. It also showers really well, like you want, whatever you use, you want it to sprinkle like rain. You don't want those like blasting hose attachments that just like, they can damage your leaves. They create divots in the soil. Um, I, <laughs> I hate saying this to rat her out, but my mother-in-law waters with one of those in pots and it drives me crazy because she'll just shoot it right in the pot and it'll create like huge divots and it'll actually expose the root. And that is bad. You want a nice, gentle, even, sprinkle whether you're in a pot or the ground. Um, also, like I mentioned before with the rocks, if you have a nice rock top dressing that can also help with that. So it'll like keep the water nice and it'll like sprinkle on there and then fall right in instead of like ricocheting off a lot of stuff. So that's a, um, another good thing to think about when you're watering. Um, here's some examples of rotting succulents so you know what to look for. Um, this is the most common killer for beginning succulent growers. Um, a lot of times, because people are like, if they see a problem or what they think is a problem, or they're just used to other plants, you water too much and then it rots. And there's pretty much no coming back from rot. So I always tell people when in doubt, just don't water. Um, it's always better to have a few leaves dry off, dry, dry out and fall off and have brown tips rather than this, because as you can see, when a plant rots, it usually starts rotting from the inside out. So this stem is dark, it's mushy, and it's bad news. Um, the only way to save a plant if this happens is sometimes if you catch it in time, this top part um, of the plant, if it's still intact and firm and fleshy and not rotted yet, you could cut it off and let it uh, callus over for a day or two. So that just means where the stem hardens off and then you could propagate it by sticking it in some soil and hope that you can save it that way. Um, yep, okay, so here is some stuff about planting. Um, you can plant them uh, as close together, far apart as you like. Um, they don't mind being crammed. So kind of back to what I was saying, if you do want that instant gratification, like go for it. They don't mind being crammed. Um, some, I kind of find that some even like it. Like I'll plant some, some succulents in like, I have this tray that I wanted to get a bunch of, and I put a bunch in there and they, they almost seem to grow faster because they were happier than if one I just planted by itself. So that's something to consider if you want a lot, a lot. Um, be mindful of the depth that your succulent was when it was planted, when, it, when you received it. Um, if, if it's planted too high, um, that 
it can rot um or it can sorry if it's planted too high the stuff that's that hasn't been exposed to sun before can burn um it also can like flop over so like i always use my hand as an example like let's say this is like kind of the the soil line if you plant it too high like this um, the roots aren't anchored enough and it's top heavy and it could flop over. Um, that can even lead to the stem breaking and that's bad news um, or the roots kind of like ripping off. Um, but if it's planted too low, then you can rot those leaves. So you don't really don't want any of the leaves like buried in the soil or um, really even touching them um, because that can, that can add to the rot. Um, if you, with that said, it, let's say just for example, like I've had some plants that got really long and tall and there are certain kinds that actually shoot roots off from the stems. And if you have one of those and you were to bury something like that deeper, um, that's totally fine. So, you know, like with all of this, it's like guide, guidelines um, and loose rules. So there's like really no like hard and fast rules. So these are just like, there's, there's exceptions to the rules lots of times is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> oh, whoops. And um, when you do your holes, usually just do it about double the size of your plants. That's totally good enough. Um, and uh, just a little side note is succulents will tolerate losing quite a bit of their roots and still thrive. So don't worry if some break. That's another reason why they're so good for beginners is because I feel like a lot of people are like, I'm scared, I'm gonna hurt it. And what if something breaks? And like, they don't care. Um, they propagate really well with no roots at all and just stems. And when I do my succulent arrangements, I always feel kind of guilty saying this, but sometimes if I really want to fit a plant in a pot because of it, because it looks so great, but its roots are really big, I've been known to root, like rip half of the root system off before to get it to fit in there. And it didn't care at all. So just a note. So don't be scared. <laughs> and with that said too, like if you put something in a place and then you're like, oh, I don't like it there. It looks ugly. Dig it up, put it somewhere else. It's not generally going to have the shock that another plant might. Um, okay. So soil, um, well draining soil is the most important thing. Um, this is kind of like a fancy little test you can do to see it, how well your soil does drain. Um, it should, I mean, basically a good rule of thumb is like, if you fill a hole, you should, you should immediately start to see it drain. Um, there, this is like a fancy way to see, like you can, there's a, there's a, um, there are different guidelines for like timing that you can do to like actually see how fast your soil drains by measuring it and timing it. Um, you, you know, you could do that if you really wanted to get into it, but like the, the most, important rule of thumb is like visually you should be able to see that start going and if it doesn't that's okay you can amend it with things like here that are here um this lava rock is great pumice is good um and a lot of people like perlite um uh, i don't i use it for propagating only i don't like it in the soil um it basically is like so lightweight at, that it like ends up floating to the top of the soil after a while. Um, so I would forget that unless you like have it and you just wanna use it, but it's better for propagation. Um, and then the lava rock, I prefer for that to mix into the soil. Um, it's better for landscaping because first of all, it looks better. It blends with the soil better and you don't have as much like spotty looking soil, which you know doesn't necessarily matter, especially if you're using a top soil. But um, also it has, um, or it, it, let's see, what, like, how do I say this? So with the pumice is better in pots because it has more nutrients is really the thing. Um, and so that's really the only reason why I use the white pumice in my pots. And then this in the soil. Um, let's see, okay. And actually I had a little uh, tidbit too is that this perlite is um, actually, it's super heated pumice and it's like popped like popcorn. So this perlite, another reason why I wouldn't put it in the ground is it's totally void of any nutrients. So there's really like no reason to use it except for propagating to make your soil extra light and fluffy. Okay, so light, this is important and it affects them so much. Um, so contrary, like I said, to popular belief, um, a lot of, most succulents prefer like part 
shade and part sun, or at least like some kind of filtered um, sun. Now that, you know, again, that's general. It depends on where you live. So like for me, I'm in Oakland. I, we don't generally get very hot. Um, so I could get away with putting something in full all day blasting sun um, more so than let's say someone in like Concord who's getting like constant 100, 100 degree days and it's really gonna suffer. It would be probably be too intense. So that's something to think about is where you are and how hot you get. Um, um, you know, and some you totally can do it and, and it'll be fine, but like most look best with some relief. Um, and they'll need less frequent water watering, like I said before, if they have some shade. Um, here are some examples of sunburn. So this can happen if they do get too much sun. Now, usually the burning occurs uh, with transition to different exposure. So um, that just means that if you have had a succulent in the shade all its life, or you buy it from a nursery where it's under like a partial cloth, and then you put it directly into all day sun, more sun than it's had, it will burn just like people. So see these like brown spots is all burns. Um, so uh, a way to avoid this is you can just slowly transition it. So um, you can just like every couple of days, move it more and more into the place that you're going to put it and see how it does um, so that it's not just like, boom. I always, I always think of it like uh, being in, like being indoors all winter and then all of a sudden you go to the beach like all day long. And even though you put on sunscreen, it's like, oh my God, I got burnt because your body isn't used to it, right? You got to like build that, that layer. It's the same thing with plants. Um, so here's an example too of like the same exact plant um, in my nursery that I had in the sun versus one that was in way less sun. So it's, sometimes it's great. Sometimes you want it to be in more sun and you get like more intense color or you have this beautiful pale blue and that's totally fine too. But these are just like things to notice why they're doing that. Um, another thing to note too is I don't think I have a slide of it, um, but a lot of times if a plant is too stressed in the sun, like particularly aloe will do this. If you see an aloe that is very tight and, the, and it's tied up on itself and um, the leaves are kind of like cupped inward towards each other, it's like literally hiding from the sun. It's like, oh, it's too much. I'm gonna close myself up so I don't have as much sun coming down on me. And then on the exact opposite of that, if an aloe is not getting enough sun, it will fully flop open, all of its leaves will be like stretched out. Some will be pointing down, it'll be pale in color. And then you know, like, oh, this probably isn't very happy either. So like both extremes are not, not great for the plant. So find that, find that middle ground. Um, let's see how I'm doing on time. Okay, cool. Um, so the opposite of that is called atoliation. That's the fancy word for when I say a succulent is a reaching for the sun. Kind of like I was talking about before, only this, they go so far as to get stretched out. So um, you'll see the leaves will start to get further apart. So see these big spaces, it's supposed to grow, like this is an Echeveria. So it's supposed to be short and pretty like a little rose. And this has, is not getting enough sun. So what it's actually doing is it's increasing its surface area so that it can get more sun to its roots, to its, to, you know, take in for energy. Um, which is, I think, really awesome that they adapt like this. So this most commonly happens with indoor plants because um, a lot of people, you know, they love them, they think they're beautiful and they want them in their house. And a lot of times, even if you put them in a window, it's just not the same. It's just not as much sun as if they're outside. Even if, even if something's outside in the shade or part shade, it's still nowhere near, um, you know, it's still, it's still getting way more light than it would be inside. Unless you have like a really, really awesome sunny window, um, I would say, you know, enjoy a potted arrangement and the Echeveria and all these pretty ones for like a few weeks and then maybe consider moving them somewhere else. So where they have more light so they don't do this. Because what happens when they do this, it's fine. They're not going to die usually. But in extreme cases, this stem will just get so skinny and weak that a lot of times they just break because they can't support themselves. So, and they just don't look as good. 
Um, okay. Oh, um, I want to, I listed some, uh, some plants that will be better inside. Um, so if you really do want to do it, Hawarthia, some aloe, some anonium, um, these will all do well inside. Um, really because they're like slower growers or they can just like handle more shade. Um, if you do an aeonium, you could do like a with those variegated ones I found do really well inside. Um, I've noticed that sometimes things that are very uh, variegated, which means they have the white or like different colors um, hybridized into them, they will handle lower light I've noticed or like more, sh more shade and could maybe be tried out inside. Um, okay, so uh, pruning and fertilizing. Um, here is an example of an overgrown container. So when this happens with a container or even in your yard, um, it's great to cut back the plants. Um, you'll give more space to other plants. If you remove some stuff that's just going nuts, so they'll get more light, they'll have more, more room to do their thing. You could even um, take whole plants out and and just put it in the ground or put it in a different pot and then like backfill in those spaces with more soil so that there's just more space for it to grow. Um, oh, and don't ever throw away your succulents, <laughs> your cuttings. Um, if you put it on your sidewalk, like I was saying before, just like put them on the sidewalk, people will take them. I do that often and I you'd be surprised how fast they'll go. Um, and if you want to try propagating, um, you can, like I said, stick stuff in soil uh, with the cuttings and most of the time things will root and it doesn't hurt to try. So if you want to try, I suggest just going for it. You could do it in the ground too. Um, and I think there was something I forgot to say about light, darn it, now I forget. Oh, yes. Um, I wanted to say with the light, like if you have a really bright, full sun area. Um, aside from things like the trees for canopies like I was talking about, you could also, the way you position plants next to each other, that will help give a break from the sun. So for example, if you had a really big agave and then you wanted to put a more delicate echeveria next to it, kind of nestled, that will give it a break from the sun. So think about like where your sun is going during the, during the hottest months and if that little echeveria or a little delicate sedum as a ground cover might get like a little bit of a break from just other big things like the rocks will do that too. So just think about how things are nestled together and they'll like help each other um, be protected from the sun. So okay back to this. So um, fertilizing is is like totally up to each his own because I don't do it super often, I tend to do it more with things that are in pots. Um, the reason for this is that these guys are just so like good and like used to harsh conditions, like I was saying, that they're like probably fine with, your, with just with your native soil. Um, when things are planted in the ground, you have like a natural environment of like, you have worms, you have bugs, you have minerals from rocks and um, it's like a, just a good little ecosystem. And so it's probably fine. But if you want to do it, you just really want to get them big and growing crazy. Um, you can do, I do like this liquid fish emulsion. I've done that before. It's a little stinky, even though it says it's like non-scented. Um, so just be prepared for that. But it's nice because you can just like do it every once in a while and mix it in with your water and just like water, water with it. And it's like all super organic. Um, and then the other thing to think about is you, um, the, the levels of the minerals, so of, of these elements, so nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So when you look at a fertilizer, there'll be three, those three letters, that's what they are representing, how much of each of those things they have in them. So the best thing to do is get something that's balanced. So it'll say 10, 10, 10, 14, 14, 14 just things that are similar is, is good. So it's not like too extreme of, of one thing or another. Um, and generally you only wanna fertilize like in the spring and summer what in like the active growing season. Um, a lot of times things in winter are dormant. There are a few succulents that actually their growing season is winter like aeoniums and you could fertilize those then, but otherwise everything else is kind of just like chilling out, like hanging just 
just resting until things get warm and happy for it again. Um, Jennifer, we have a couple yeah. questions. Yeah, perfect. Um, so one of them is kind of from what you were talking about earlier on with uh, placing succulents. They're asking if succulents spread or do they stay the, stay the same size? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, everything is, every succulent is different. So some like, like example here with these like little guys, um, they spread, um, whereas the Echeveria, it will spread, but what it does is pups, which is like, they'll have more little rosettes that cluster around them. Um, just like, you know, like an agave, sometimes those have little, little babies, sometimes they don't. It kind of depends on each species is different. Um, so just kind of like, look into that when you're choosing to see how much room you want to give it. Um, but yeah, they're all kind of different, like I said, and like the, the worst problem you're going to have, which is not really a problem is if something goes bananas, like I was saying, you can just like rip out part of it. <laughs> and the only thing I would say, watch out for are like certain agaves get really, really big. Um, granted, it does take a long time for them to do that, but that's something to think about. They're are so many different kinds and things that are hybridized to not get big now that um, like there's a really cool um, agave that has like a white stripe and it's been um, made so that it only gets about four feet by four feet. So it doesn't get like, you know, the crazy 12 foot high ones. Um, so yeah, good question. So they're all, they're all kind of different. Great, another question came up about watering. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth wants to know when you're watering in the ground, how do you know when it's enough? Ooh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, um, gosh, I do everything by hand. So it, like, I just kind of feel it out. I, I, I like to like you hover over. I mean, you can kind of see on the ground when it, things are like puddling, um, and sinking, like I was saying. So, and again, in the ground is not like as uh, like crazy delicate as if something was in a pot. So like if you were to underwater, uh, like a, a good way to know is if things were getting brown edges, like I was saying, it's like, oh, that maybe I'm not watering enough. Um, a good way to do it is um, like, go. I go over things multiple times in case I miss something or, um, you know, it depends on your drip system too. So like, you know, like 15 minutes once a week might be enough depending on what you have or like maybe it needs to be like half an hour once a week. So again, unfortunately there's no like clear answer. You kind of got to feel it out, but I, you know, definitely not just like a sweep with the hose and that's it. So um, like, I know this is not in the ground, but like you, you basically want to try to visualize like the water seeping into the soil if that's possible for you um because you want to make sure like all those roots are getting water and not just this little top part i don't know if that i don't know if that was helpful at all but um yeah you kind of just got to feel it out everybody everything's different can i do one or two more questions then we'll save the rest for the end um yeah, we have a good I'm question pretty, on i'm pretty much done so um we can just kind of go for it if you want this was my last okay. slide <laughs> oh great okay awesome so we have a good question on native plants linda says she likes to use native plants in her garden how can she check if the succulents are native to california oh that's a good question um there are there are few there i know there's a one is a dudleya that grows native on our coast um, I'm trying to think offhand what else I know for sure. Um, that, that website I referenced, the world of succulents, that's a good one. Cause it'll say like where things are from, but lots of times things are native to like South America or, or Africa. Um, some like those shrubs that I like are native to like Australia, but they're great cause they're drought tolerant. So yeah, that, that world of succulents would be a good place to look up where they're from. Great. We have a question actually about this slide asking oh. that pot that has all the different succulents in it, do those all have similar water needs? Oh, that's a great question. Um, 
Yes, I would say so. Um, sometimes the little, like these little teeny things with teeny leaves and teeny stems sometimes want a little bit more water than others. And same with this um, sedum right here that's kind of hanging over. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see the stems are a little bit dry. Um, I honestly, like unless it's, so, so certain, the things that I try to avoid mixing with other succulents are like Hawarthia or cacti um, and Gasteria are another one that really, really like to get extra dry. And I generally don't mix those because it's risky. Um, but I feel like they're so adaptable to put together like that, that go for it. <laughs> Um, like, again, that's like a rule and things you like people, people ask me that a lot, actually. And it's something that I've started to think less and less about just because I've had such good luck with them just like figuring it out. Like I said, when things are clustered together, I almost feel like they just kind of like balance each other out and, um, and like insulate each other. So even if one maybe wanted more water than the other, because they're kind of like tight together, it doesn't dry out as fast. Does that make sense? So I would say, don't worry too much about that unless it was one of those things I mentioned, the um, Gasteria or Hawarthia or a cactus. Great. And what you could yeah. do too, sorry, now I'm like thinking more about it. What you could do too, what I've done when I really do wanna do that is the area where that is planted. So this is gonna go for the ground specifically, like with that garden I showed you I was doing, we did do a few cacti. And so what we did when we planted that is you just mix in, in that, in that hole that you create for it, mix in way more pumice than in the other areas. And that will help. And that's how you can kind of do it in a pot too. Great. We have another question kind of related to water. Is mulching around the planting area recommended? Yes, you can do that too. Um, I should have mentioned that. Um, I tend to like the look of rocks around succulents, but mulching is fine too. Um, with any time you mulch, just like with other plants, um, just be a little bit careful of how close you put it to the stem of the plant. Because as the mulch breaks down, it actually gives off quite a bit of heat and like some off gassing. Well, and while succulents are pretty tough and probably won't mind that too much, um, you just wanna like, just give a little a little space um, when you put it around. But yeah, mulch is great. It's a good way to keep down weeds. Obviously it looks awesome and it does help to retain some moisture too. So good question. Anything else? Great, yes, one second. We have a question about similar to the natives, but do succulents support native wildlife, bugs, et cetera? Is there any that you especially recommend to help um, wildlife? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, a lot of them flower, uh, which is great. I have like hummingbirds galore in my nursery in the spring and summer, and it's fantastic. Um, as far as like benefiting insects and stuff, I mean, and I have bees too with the flowers. So there's not, there's nothing like negative that I, as far as I know that I'm aware of, um, they are a little bit susceptible to, um, there's like a few bugs that I noticed they get the most, which is mealybug, which is like that little white powdery thing. You can usually find it at like the intersection of the, the leaf and the stem. Um, and sometimes on the flowers too. And I, what I, I think the most important thing for that is like, as far as, you know, the benefit of the wildlife, just don't use pesticides like any other plant. Um, th that's no good. Um, so what I like to do for that is I use um, rubbing alcohol. Actually, I do like a 50% uh, water and 50% rubbing alcohol in a spray bottle for mealy, especially. And I just um, like spray it and try to do it um, like in the early morning or evening when bees aren't as active. But the great thing about the, um, the rubbing alcohol is it evaporates so quickly. So it's not gonna really hurt anything that, that's, that's not like directly coming in contact with. So it's gentle. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't know of any like specific stuff. I mean, as long as your plant is like happy and healthy, it's gonna support all that good stuff. 
we have a question about succulents and gophers. Are succulents gopher proof? Um, no. And should they, they're keeping their succulents in pots, but want to know kind of what to do about gophers. Yeah, um, gophers suck. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so that's a good solution. Um, you can use the cages. They're annoying, but I know they make like gopher cages that you can plant your the roots in. So it's like protects them from, from getting attacked. Um, the unfortunate thing about succulents is they like do hold a lot of water. So sometimes those kinds of pests are particularly drawn to them I've seen. However, I have a gopher at my nursery and I kind of did a test and put some in the ground and like, when was it? I think in the fall and they're fine so far. Um, we'll see how they do the rest of the summer. I'm not sure. Um, I wish I had a better answer maybe google it <laughs> honestly maybe there's like some other magical answers that i don't know of sorry we have a question i might pronounce the plant wrong but etaliation right? oh etaliation uh-huh yes can you just cut the flower top off and replant it great question yes definitely do that i would recommend that and uh when you do that i would probably cut it like like pretty far down so that when you get because you'll get new growth on your the place you cut it you'll probably get like multiple which is kind of fun um like little rosettes coming back depending on what your plant is um and then yeah you can plant that top part so when you plant that top part if it's really long i would say like chop that so it's shorter right so you don't have this like huge skinny thing to plant so chop it so it's maybe like this big and then you'll remove all of the leaves on the stem, not all of them, sorry, like enough to create its own little stem so that when you uh, like, <laughs> so when you plant it, none of this stuff that's going in the soil has any uh, leaves on it because those will just rot and it'll make everything funky. So we pull those little leaves off there, let, let it like lay in the shade um, for about a day until the bottom hardens off. Um, that what that does is it keeps um, like soil borne pathogens from getting in there. So think of it like uh, when we get a cut, we get a scab, same thing. It's just like a little protection from that flesh of the succulent. So do that before and then yeah, go ahead and just stick that little stem in and it should root within, especially right now within a matter of weeks. Awesome. We are gonna to continue to answer questions. I do wanna recognize that it is eight o'clock. So if anyone does need to sign off, thank you so much for joining us. And as I mentioned, this class will be recorded and posted on the Bosco website. And as Jennifer here, come say hi at her um, new location. Yeah, so, uh, yeah I, I kind of skipped that because I got excited about the, uh, the plants, but um. Uh, yeah, I have a storefront and it's in Rockridge and I now have like a ton of houseplants too. So just when I need another obsession, um, but my husband makes um, handmade furniture that we have in there too. And he's been making me a lot of plant stuff lately, like plant shelves and risers, which is great. So yeah, if you have like plant questions or another little tidbit I'll just mention before you guys go that I offer is if you need a drainage hole in pots, <laughs> a lot of times people do because there's so many cute pots that don't have holes I can drill a hole for you so yeah if you have plant questions so uh, come on in and say hi and then there's all my other info my um, email and my Instagram and all that good stuff so hey okay, and we are going to continue to answer questions awesome. um Okay. So that? we do have one about, do you recommend letting all succulent cutting scab for a few days before planting them in the ground? Yeah. Um, yes. It's, it's best practice to do that. Again, it's just a rule and rules are meant to be broken sometimes. Um, I have been known to be super impatient and I'll cut them and do them in the same moment. Um, and it's generally fine. But if you really want to make sure it's like super successful uh, and you are not so impatient like me, I would, yes, definitely recommend letting that happen. Usually it only takes 24 hours, sometimes even just overnight. What it really depends on is the size of the stem. 
So something little will probably take 24 hours, but I have uh, beheaded like really big echeverias that have stems like this big or even um, like agaves where I had to like actually saw a huge thing off and that like a huge big plant this big. And that can take like up to a week, if not more to harden off. And that's totally fine. It'll just sit there, put it again, try to put it probably in like the shade. So it's just not as stressed and just wait. Um, and cacti sometimes even longer. So like a really big, like euphorbia like this, um, that's sawed off. You can just, again, just lay it somewhere and wait. And the, the best way to know is it literally will just be like dry. Like it'll feel like a scab and there won't be any like sticky wet uh, flesh. So that's how you know. We have a question going back to sunlight. Jane says that she has trouble striking a balance between shielding my succulents from direct sun and making sure they're visible tucked partially under a non-succulent plant or a rock. Any mm -hmm. further suggestions on that? Hmm. Yeah, that's tough. Um, you want them to be happy. Um, I, let's see, what else could you do? Um, I mean, those are the best things. The, the next thing I would say, if you're really having trouble with just too much sun is you might want to get like one of those shade sails. They make those like in different colors. They make those like triangular ones. Um, even if it didn't, if you, if you had like trees or, you know, like a, if you, even if you didn't have anything to string it from, you could get like a, like some really thin um, pipes or something or like posts and put those into the ground and do that. Um, even if it wasn't like, even if it was just small, that might help because if you think about um, how the sun moves, even if it just kind of cuts the sun in a couple, in a few places for short parts of the day, you know, like as the sun moves, that could help. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, I would just keep trying to move stuff is my, is all I can say. And then, and just look out for those signs, like I was saying of like, if it looks unhappy, if it's like too curled up or too like red or dry versus like reaching too much. I mean, really like if they're not, if they're not getting enough sun outside, like they generally just are like a little bit more pale um, unless you have like tons of shade. Well, I don't know if that helps at all, I'm sorry. You can send me a picture actually. If you want, like email me or like send me an Instagram message of your yard and maybe I would be able to help you much better than just guessing. <laughs> Great. Um, this is kind of a follow-up to one of the previous questions. Can you grow succulents in your yard from a cutting? How best do you suggest you do this? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Um, you could go ahead and pop stuff in the ground, but I find the best way to do it is start it in a pot like get a little pot or like a shallow dish and get them started there first. And then that, it's just a, such a good way to be able to like um, move it around. Like a lot of times too with cuttings, um, I like to put them, like make sure those are in partial shade just because they're like a little bit delicate. You wanna kind of give them a break when they're getting started. So um, like in my nursery where I have them, it's like under like a shade cloth on a shelf. So they're getting just like, really bright ambient and only limited direct sun during the day. Um, and then like you, cause it's just easier to check them and see how they're doing that way also. So like you can like pull them out of the pot um, and not, and it won't be as disruptive as if you were like checking on them in the ground, you know what I mean? So um, if you just, if you really wanna make sure it's like happy before you put it in the ground, I would, I would do it that way. Um, otherwise just, you could put them directly in the ground and just kind of same thing, like make sure they're not like out in the middle of nothing with no break from the sun, like do them, you know, like next to a rock or next to something tall because they'll probably be little and you want them to be more protected. Think of them like little babies. They need, they need a little help to get started. We have another question on education. Do you have any good books to recommend that give sizes of plants? 
Ooh, that gives sizes of plants particularly. Not, no, not that I can think of my favorite, one of my favorite plant guys is Jeff Moore. He has a ton of different books that they're, they're better, I would say, for identifying things. Um, like sometimes he mentions the size of things, but I wouldn't say like it's specifically good for that, unfortunately. Um, honestly, the be like the best way is like if you know the name of something, the best way to, is to look online. Um, and then just the only thing I'll say about like referencing things online is just make sure that you're um, actually looking at the right plant because a lot of times people will misidentify things online. Um, and so you might get bad information, but like big nurseries, like, um, let's see, uh, like Monrovia and I can't think of any other, but if it's like, if it's like a, an actual plant nursery, that's like telling you about a plant, I would trust them versus like someone writing a blog or something like that, because a lot of times they get the names wrong. Um, but yeah, if you know the name of it, I would say that's just the best, the best way and the fastest way. The Do you have a suggestion of some succulents that flowers? Oh yeah, um, my favorites are um, Echeveria elegans. It's little, uh, well, yeah, it's little. They stay more petite, like this big, but they cluster. They shoot a lot of pups, like I was saying, like little babies. Um, and when they bloom, it is just this beautiful arch and they all like each little head will bloom. And it's this like beautiful yellowy pink bell that hangs and um, hummingbirds go crazy for them. Um, also aloe, all, most all of them have pretty wonderful blooms that are huge that also the hummingbirds love. Um, I find them, the hummingbirds going mostly probably after the aloe. Um, and then my one other favorite is um, Kalanchoe. And that's that's a big genus. And a lot of them have some, like they have similar flowers, but I feel like the most impressive ones are the, what is it? The, um, I think it's called Mariners and Lavender Scallops. They have these big, like, orangey red bells that are just like there's tons of them and that is a good landscape succulent I would say because it it's nice and tall but not too tall like they're usually about like a foot and a half and they cluster they'll they spread widthwise really well so if you were to plant like I don't know like one two three in a nice space and just let them fill in over a few years when they bloom you'll get this like huge awesome like strip of great flowers and they last a long time so yeah those are my faves we did have a follow-up if possibly um uh they could reach out to you jennifer or you could send me kind of a list of some of those plants because they wanted to know that the spelling that can be shared oh sure well. yeah 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 um i can i'll uh email you linda and you can send that out or i mean or either way like if you want to just um email me is probably the best way and just be like hey what did you mention and then I great can, yeah um also I, we have some more questions please feel free to put more in the chat i see we still have around 45 people here which is awesome please raise your hand also if you want to be unmuted and ask jennifer directly yeah that's um great. We have a question from Trish saying, I want to plant in a tilted wheelbarrow. Any tips? Would it be helpful to use something like chicken wire midway through under the dirt or attached to the container to help hold the dirt intact? Do you have any issues with using pine cones as part of the soil aeration? Ooh, interesting. Um... I would, I, the only, th I, that's awesome. I've done that before. It looks super cool. Um, I would, the only thing is just make sure there's lots of holes in it to take a drill, put lots of drainage holes um, and use succulent soil. So it's nice and gritty and well draining, but otherwise you shouldn't need to use chicken wire or anything like that. And I would definitely not use pine cones because as they break down, they're going to get like, I mean, I don't think it would be awful, but you just don't need to. And, and I, yeah, I wouldn't do it. Um, the like pumice and sand and stuff like that, that's in the succulent soil would be totally fine. Actually, I would just, yeah, I would use straight succulent soil 
or even consider adding a little regular potting soil with it so it's not as dry. And the reason I say that is because it's metal and the metal can like heat up a lot in the summer, especially if there's sun beating on it. So it might like dry out extra fast. So you could kind of make your soil like a little less drainy, just a, just a teeny bit. If you live in a really hot place, if not, don't worry about it. Just succulent soil is fine, but yeah, it should stay in place and fill in really well. And unless it has like some crazy angle or something where you're not able to keep the soil in, you don't need chicken wire or anything, just plant directly in there and it'll look great. Send me pictures. <laughs> we have a couple more questions. Feel free to add more to the chat. Um, my, this is kind of a follow-up of with pests and kind of natural pest control. My succulents and containers sometimes get root, mealy bugs. What is causing that and how do you control slash prevent it? Oh, that's the worst. Um, I actually offhand don't remember, I don't know like what the, like what the actual cause is. Um, like a lot of plants that get pests, it can be if they are too, if they're like unhealthy or not very happy. Um, and another weird reason is if they're too healthy and happy, it's like a strange thing. If they're like too happy, like that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm not like super into fertilizing. Cause if they're just like too amazing, it's like, I don't know, it's attractive to bugs. And then if something's too unhealthy, it's attracted to, to bugs. Cause it's like, it's an easy target, I guess, kind of thing. Um, but the best way I have found to get rid of that is hydrogen peroxide, which is awesome because I don't like using crap, um, even things that like sometimes are organic or like, like just harsh. So hydrogen peroxide, I found like instantly kills them. It like sizzles them. And it's also totally fine for the roots and the roots love it because it like aerates them. So when you use it, there's different ratios to use and I feel like when I use it I, I kind of wing it like I'll just get one of those bottles and I get my watering can and I'll put in maybe like a quarter or a half of the bottle maybe like a quarter of the bottle in a big watering can and fill it up and just water it wherever you're finding it and if it's in a pot it's easier to check right because then you can like lift it out and see um, and if it's in the ground it's a little harder but like I would just do that like maybe if it's in the ground, I would probably do that like once a week for a couple of weeks just to make sure that you're getting them all. We have two more questions. Um, we have time for a couple more if anyone has any more. <coughs> Are there any succulents that can droop and fall over the sides of pots? Ooh, yeah. Um, if you're doing like any potted arrangement, I always like try to have one thing that's hanging because it looks so great. Um, my favorite is Tritoscantia. There's a couple kinds. There's like a white kind that's, uh, I think it's called uh, pale, pale Puma. And it's like, a, it's like a light green that has like a soft fuzz over it and that hangs really nice. Um, and there's another purple version that I think is called Pumilla. I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one, but it's basically trying to scan to like the common one that people know is purple heart. So it's like longer leaves, but there's different ones that droop over. Um, also, there's a lot of sedums that do that. Um, there's one that's called, uh, what is it? Little Missy. <laughs> and it's like this really cute, delicate little like white and pale green with like some pink edges. And it will over time, like kind of like cascade over. Um, all the string uh, senecios are great. So like string of dolphins, string of bananas, string of pearls, those are good too. And really fun. Um, certain ones of those can handle more sun than others. Like I found like uh, the fish hooks, which is like the bluer one with the bigger hook like leaves um, that can handle like more sun than like a string of pearls. String of pearls can be a little bit delicate. You can even do those, you can do string of pearls inside um, somewhat successfully. Um, let's see, am I forgetting anything? I'm like looking in my store to see if there's anything in there. Um, uh, those are my favorites offhand, but there's lots. Any other questions? 
uh, please put them in the chat. We can hang out for a couple more minutes. Also, like I said, you can raise your hand if you want to be unmuted. Um, we do have a question related to your store. If you ship plants. Um, right now I'm only shipping, uh, my succulent wreaths. Um, and yeah, I'm not shipping like I get in touch with me. <laughs> I don't normally, but if there's like something in particular that you're looking for that I have succulents ship succulents ship. Well, yes, I can do that. Yes. In other words, I don't have them like listed on my site is what I'm saying. Cause I just generally don't do that as much now that I have the storefront, but yeah, if there's something you really want um, that I have, I'd be happy and I just ship it bare root. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for making water conservation a way of life. Please check out our Save Water um, Milpitas. Save, yeah, sorry, SaveWaterMilpitas.org and our Earth Day website. Please join us for our, our, our coming up FOSTA workshop. And thank you so much. Have a great day and happy almost Earth Day. And thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Let me know if you have questions. Thank you, everyone. Good night.